for the past couple years, I've been working on data science applications using Wolfram technology, and uh, most recently in the cloud. Uh, this talk is going to consist almost entirely of examples of doing data science um, in, in the cloud uh, with data coming from a variety of sources and a variety of domains. Uh, it's more than we can possibly talk about in 20 minutes in any detail. So my hope is that some of this will be close to something that you are working on and that you will seek me out later so that we can have a more in-depth conversation about how this stuff might be able to help you. Um, the, the data that we're going to be looking at is going to be coming from plain old files. It's going to be coming from public APIs. It's going to be coming from ex external services. Um, and it's also going to, be going, to, going to be coming from databases. On the analysis side of things, I'll try to point out instances where we're using relatively recent fu functionality that's been relatively recently introduced, like uh, time, series and time series analysis and geographics and machine learning. Um, and then on the publication side, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll emphasize, I, I think the publication side of, thing, side of things is the part that gets weirdest when the cloud is introduced. It has the most new concepts in it. And, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say a bit about how computable documents work in the cloud, how, do you, how you deploy them, how notebook templating works, and about this uh, Wolfram language construct called the document generator that ties all these things together. OK, so let's jump right in. Let's get some data from Instagram. So I'm going to open up a template notebook on my desktop that is designed to pull in data from Instagram and make a little report. Okay, so we're not in the cloud here. We're, right in, we're on my desktop. This is a template notebook. Uh, it behaves just like a normal Mathematica notebook, except that it has this uh, toolbar at the top. I'm going to press this generate button and keep jabbering while it's working. Uh, the toolbar at the top controls the behavior and appearance of documents that are generated from this template. Um, what, is this, what is this template trying to accomplish? It's going to connect to the Instagram service, and it's going to use that service to pull in the latest, the latest 10 photographs for this user, which happens to belong to Yellowstone National Park. Uh, once, I get those, once I get those images, I'm going to run image, ident image identify on them. If you saw the keynote this morning, this is the Wolfram language function that's been trained on a large corpus of, uh, of known images and does a fair, fairly good job of recognizing objects in the images. Okay. Um, this has, has not yet finished on the desktop, but that's okay. Um, so, so that will finish eventually on the desktop. Uh, in the, in, but th that's a purely desktop resident uh, uh, workflow. Uh, what, how, how, do we move this, how do we move this into the cloud? What one would like is the ability to sort of upload that template, have it persist in the cloud, and then whenever I wanted a report based on that template, be able to sort of tickle it or tell it to go, and then it, it would uh, communicate with wh whatever data sources it needed to. Oh, here, yeah, here we finished. Um, you would communicate with whatever data sources it need to. You would need to to generate the document and then deliver it to people I wanted. To, I would want to get that document. All right. So let's see what that document looks like on the desktop. All right. So this just went out to Instagram. It pulled in the latest 10 photos that had been posted by Yellowstone National Park and ran image identify on them, and were able to identify things like stags, hot springs, bison, coniferous trees, Fuller's teasel. Now that's impressive if it's true. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Image, ImageIdentify.com is very fun to play with if you, if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, this is a mashup using, using an external service and, and that built-in function. Um, so to get this thing up into the cloud, you, you use this magical cloud deploy function and you build a, a construct called a document generator. This is typically a long one-liner. You specify a template, in this case the one we were just looking at, and then various options like, like uh, who you want this, this, this report to be delivered to and in what format. Okay. So I already have one of these things deployed. It's already sitting up there in the, cl in the cloud. I'm going to ask for a fresh instance of it right now. Okay. So this is going off and asking the public cloud to run that report. And I'm going to check my inbox before the end of the talk, and hopefully it will have arrived, and I can, I can show you this thing having actually worked. In the meantime, I'm going to show you the results of a previous run. Here it is. Okay. So now we're in the browser. This is in the cloud. This is a result of, the, of a previous run of that same document generator using that same template. Okay, and you can see it looks, it looks for all practical purposes identical, and that's because it is. Right? Um, the, but the, this being in the cloud now, this being in a browser, it's shareable via link. Okay, so this thing is no longer trapped on your desktop, it's out there in the world. Okay, let's take a look at another template. Here's one we worked up to do some simple analytics on tweets. Okay, so this one is going to use the uh, Twitter service to look for the past 500 tweets containing token. Uh, this is called a template slot. You can fill it with whatever you want to when you're generating the report. It's going to default to the string Wolfram. Okay. And we can deploy it in the same way using the same cloud deploy. I've done that. 
I, I will ask, in fact, I will go back to my presentation here and ask for a fresh instance of that report, and hopefully that will show up too in my inbox before the talk is over. And in the meantime, I can show you the results of a, of a previous run. Okay, so here's, here's the results of a previous run using that, using that template and generating a report. Uh, so these are the past 500 tweets in the world that contain the string Wolfram. It's not guaranteed that they, that they, that they have anything to do with our company. Um, but this, this template does uh, sentiment analysis on the, on the tweets uh, using the built-in classifier function. And, and we can see they're, they're mostly indifferent, but we're happy to see that the happies outweigh the sads by two to one or so. And then we have a, uh, a pushpin map of where the tweets originated. Now, interestingly, the, 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 the um, Twitter service does not report the latitude and longitude of where the tweets came from. Uh, you have to infer that from the user's self-reported location. And we, we, we back a latitude and longitude out of that using interpreter, uh, which is one of the functions that came out of the, that came out of the, the, uh, the Wolfram Alpha integration um, with, with the technology stack. Um, so this is a case where, where totally unstructured data has, has, has enabled us to make a, a very definite map of where the tweets are coming from. And here's that same data aggregated by country and turned into a, a georegion plot. And so on. I'll just show you a couple more templates that do very similar things. All right, so here's a, here's a template that I worked up to analyze my house utilities usage. So I, I keep my utilities data in an online spreadsheet. And Google Docs makes it very easy to publish these things as, as publicly, if you want them to be public, they can be public, publicly readable uh, CSVs which then you can, you can um, slurp and, and, and do whatever you want with. So this template is going to do some very simple time series analysis and visualization and a little bit of forecasting. Um, so when I deploy this using the same cloud deploy and the same document generator and I, and I uh, tell it to run, I get a report that looks like this. Not that one, this one. Okay. All right, so this gray blob you see here is a semantically imported data set that contains the data from that online spreadsheet. Um, Things that look like dates in that spreadsheet have been automatically turned into computable date objects. Things that look like money in that spreadsheet have been turned into, into computable financial quantities, and so on. I didn't have to do any of this manually, so that takes a lot of the sting out of the, the um, sort of the, the nuts and bolts part of, uh, of data science. And then this data set is available for, for subsequent queries and operations. Uh, here's, a, here's a time series of my, the, let's see, the green trace is my gas usage. The orange one is my electricity usage. These two peaks are the past two polar vortex winters. Um, here's, some, here's some attempts to look at summer versus winter usage. Uh, here's some forecasting. So here's my total utilities bill, electricity plus gas. And then I, I use time series model fit with an autoregressive model to, um, to forecast this out for six months to see what it looks like. I don't have any cycles here, so this is kind of a toy. Uh, but nevertheless, I hope this is correct. And we're not looking at another 2014. Uh, here's an example of a template that, that queries the Wolfram data drop. So uh, data drop is this, is this general purpose uh, data accumulator. Stephen Wolfram mentioned it in the keynote this morning. It's especially handy for uh, devices, connected devices and, and sensors. Um, any readings they take, they can dump into a data bin in data drop, and they're subsequently available offline for offline analysis. Uh, so in our case, we took one of these electric imp devices and we put it in our break room fridge and periodically it measures the light level and the temperature and it drops the data in a data bin and it's been making a giant time series since, since last April and this, this template um, pulls, in, pulls in some uh, one day's worth of data from that time series. Uh, when you deploy this and you run it, you get a report that looks like this. Okay, so uh, here's one day of data from the electric imp in the break room fridge. The blue trace is the temperature and the orange one is the light level uh, these oscillations you see here are, are the compressor cycling. And uh, when it gets crazier here, this is when people are opening and closing the fridge. And there, there's some heuristics in this report to try and determine when the fridge is open based on correlations between the light level and the temperature. And these red zones are, are in places where, in principle, you might want to issue an alarm that the fridge has been open too long. Okay. So um, this thing is now, it's automated, right? It's in the cloud, and you can have this run every hour if you want to. So you can see the beginnings, uh, or even, even um, even more often than, than that if you have a private cloud. Uh, so you can see the beginnings of how a monitoring system based on this technology would work 
The sensor itself can be very stupid. All the brains can, can live in the cloud and can be tweaked when, whenever you want. I'll show you one more along these lines. Um, the city of Chicago has very excellent publicly available analytics. Um, they have data sets on all kinds of things. Uh, this template is designed to pull in data from their, uh, from their crime database, which goes back, I think, to 2001. Um, it's it's uh, totally public and totally open, so we can get it with a straight import here. And then we're going to do some time series analysis and some mapping on, um, on, on the data in this data set. Uh, this data set is already very structured and very clean, so we don't even have to do any semantic, um, semantic importation on it. Uh, when we deploy this template and we run it, we get a report that looks like like this. Okay, so here's the past 50,000 reported crimes in Chicago. So this goes back to late summer. Um, this is aggregated by hour. So these oscillations you see are daily. If you blow this up to one week, uh, you, you get a plot that looks like this. Okay, and then if you ask, like, what is the, what is the mean number of crimes per hour by hour of the day, uh, you, get, you get a histogram that looks like this, where the, the, it's quietest around five or six in the morning, and then it's about twice that in the evening. Here's a sample of, I think, a, a thousand, a pushpin map of a, a, a thousand of the crimes in, in that, in that um, four-month sample or so um, overlaid on a map of Chicago. This is using geographics. And then you can, um, you can do a, a, a smooth kernel distribution estimation uh, based, on those, based on those incidents to generate a map like this um, and possibly identify hotspots. I'm not, sure this is, I'm not sure this is actually, I, I don't think this has any content. This is probably just showing you population density or something. But it's, it's, um, it's, in any case, it's very easy to work up things like this. And uh, OK, so here's, here's a, a real world example. Uh, the, you know, the previous five were sort of demos. This, uh, a couple weeks ago in New York, I met a guy who worked in the financial industry. And he, he um, he takes data mostly from, from Bloomberg about bonds, and he prepares reports about he prepares debt profiles on these bond series for other people in the financial industry. Um, this is not a do I don't know anything about the the, uh, the domain here, but as a reporting problem, it was it was, it was reasonably straightforward. Uh, his source data is, is CSVs, and they're not very big, so no problem there. You know, any anybody and anything can handle that. He, he for his output, he wants presenta presentation quality PDFs that he can email to people. He wants the process to be totally cloud resident, so he never has to babysit it. This is not something he wants to have to do on his laptop. He just wants to have it up there you know, running. And he, he wants to be able to drive the entire process from code. And we love to hear that. And that's, that's exactly what we want to hear. OK, so the data itself uh, looks, like, looks like this. It's just a big table, a couple of big tables. Um, this is totally meaningless to me, but meaningful to people in the financial industry. Um, so the user wrote code. He wrote his own package to take apart that data, take the fields that he wanted, compute metrics of interest to him, predictions, and so on, and then output these in, a, in, a, in another data set. Uh, and uh, here, I'll run that code right now. OK, so his intermediate output is a data set that looks like this, that contains all the things he, he's interested in. And he wants to turn this into a PDF report uh, that, with, um, you know, that looks nice and is nicely structured. So he has some further code that divides this up into, that, that, that groups this by bond series. Um, and at that point, you can template this, and, and you can template this and turn it into a report and deploy it using, using the same mechanisms that we saw in the previous five examples. Um, this one is, is slightly more grown up, and it does a few more things. It has fancy things like an epilogue function that sets the print options on the generated document so you have a nice header and footer in your, in your PDF. Um, this example is also slightly more complicated because the user has code. He has his own package. We have to upload that to the cloud and make sure that's accessible in a place where the template can get at it when it actually runs. Okay. But nevertheless, um, it, you can run this and it works. I'll show you a, here's an example of what a generated document looks like in the cloud. I'll blow this up a bit. Okay, again, this is meaningless to me, but th this, is, this, is, um, this is legit as far as he's concerned. Okay. And uh, the template that generates this looks like looks like this. So the template itself is very short, but it iterates over these various series to generate that long thing. Okay, and um, and 
I will show you the PDF that got dropped in my inbox yesterday when I ran this. Okay, so here's the PDF. So this is what he would mail. This is what he would mail to his clients. Um, so as far as that that problem and its requirements are concerned, he's able to do it completely using one document generator in, in our cloud. So that was that was gratifying. The next step he wants to take this to is to put a, a form page in front of that so that users can can show up, choose a data set of interest to them, and then generate a report like this one based on that data set. Um, so that, that's another level of integration, but totally doable. OK, uh, the final example that I want to talk about is, is um, is an interesting one, and I won't be able to get all the way through it. Uh, this is a this is a uh, a request that came from a prospective customer. Um, their task, their job, consisted of doing linear optimizations uh, all the time on constraints that were constantly changing. So linear linear optimization problem would be like uh, I, I'm a farmer. I have so many acres. I have so many gallons of fertilizer and so many gallons of pesticide. I can plant corn or beans. Uh, Corn and beans have a certain price this year. Um, how do I plant my field to maximize my income? Okay, so that, that, it's, it's that kind of problem. Um, theirs are substantially more complicated than that, but the, 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 that's the basic skeleton of it. Um, they wanted to build an application that their, their users, who are typically agents out in the field, would be able to access. So they wanted to store the constraints in a database they wanted these uh, remote agents to be able to access that database using something like a phone or a tablet app uh, to add constraints to the database and then request optimization solutions from, based on the current contents of the database. Okay, so this is an interesting example in a few ways. It's, it's not really a report-based workflow, for one thing, and it, it also it uses databases. Um, also, it uses databases, which are typically not open to the public. We typically, they're not exposed to the, to the outside world. You can still, you can still, um, you can still use a cloud-based workflow to get at them, but typically you would want to do this with a private cloud, which is hosted on your organization's internet or you know, behind a firewall, someplace where it's safe to get at that, at that private data source. Okay. And further, they were interested in visualizing the, the solutions to the solutions in visualizing their optimizations in such a way that they could play with them and see what the effects of having suboptimal solutions were. So in, in this case, here's, here's an example of uh, minimizing the quantity x plus 2y subject to a bunch of constraints. Um, the way you get at this in the Wolfram language is with this linear, pro linear programming uh, function, and there's the solution, um, and there's x plus 2y given that solution, and here's that solution visualized. Okay. Um, if you saw uh, if you saw Jan and, and John's talk at at uh, at, at one o'clock, um, getting these visualizations like this in, into the cloud is as easy as just cloud deploying them. So the same manipulate that you just saw on my desktop will also work in the cloud after I've deployed it, although it may take a minute to pop in. Or more. There it is. Okay, so here it is in the web browser with interactivity intact. Okay, so for, for those of you who do have data flows, and I suspect there are many of you that, that talk to databases and want to know how the Wolfram, how Wolfram tech, how, the, how this like uh, data science stack uh, can interact with those databases and how to build an application where people, people using API functions and form functions can talk to that database, uh, I encourage you to seek me out and I can, I can go through this example in more detail um, with you. Okay, so in, in the first, five or six examples I showed you, we had this sort of classical reporting workflow where you had data coming in, did some computation on it, and had a, a computable cloud document coming out. Um, the nicest thing about that, and I think the single most compelling feature about doing data science in the cloud is that it solves this dissemination problem of getting, 
getting, getting data and information in front of decision makers in, who don't necessarily, who wouldn't otherwise have access to the data, to the data analysis tool set. Uh, and that, that's, that's very, very useful. Um, you, you saw me in this talk flipping back and forth between cloud and, and desktop a lot. Um, that hybrid workflow is, is not only supported, it, it works very well and, is, and, is, and, and turns out to be very powerful. Um, we saw a couple examples of, of knowledge-based analytics helping us out. Uh, examples of that would be like the interpreter, interpreter function in the Twitter template, uh, which was able to infer tweet, tweet, uh, tweet locations for us based on unstructured data. Uh, semantic interpretation was able to clean up our uh, utility spreadsheet with no work on our part. Um, uh, the private clouds in the database example that I wasn't able to go through thoroughly um, are, for, are, are appropriate for data sources that you don't want to or can't expose um, to the public. We are working on a Wolfram Data Science platform that will sort of streamline the kinds of things that you've seen here. And uh, particularly the problem of working with multiple documents in a single browser tab is a very thorny design and technological problem. Uh, so you might have a, a template and a report generated by that template and possibly some other code too that you need to be editing at the same time. Uh, so the, the, the data science platform will be designed to, to make that easier. But I want to emphasize that everything you've seen here and, uh, is doable with the current cloud and was done with the current cloud um, so that if uh, any of this looks interesting or useful, um, you can start tinkering immediately. <laughs>